great deal of the philosophy that's going on today in the English-speaking world, in fact probably most of it, can be traced back through intermediate developments to the work of two men, Gottlob Frege and Bertrand Russell. Working for the most part independently of each other, they laid the foundations of modern logic. But more than that, although the work on which they began concerned chiefly the principles of mathematics and the relationship between mathematics and logic, its implications went so wide that in the course of time it came to have a profound influence on philosophy in general. Exactly the same happened with the philosopher who most obviously and directly followed on from them, namely Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein started by developing Russell's and Frege's work in mathematical logic, but he ended up acquiring an influence at large on 20th century philosophy, which is second to nobody's. In this program, without going into any of the technicalities of mathematics or logic, I want to give some indication of how Frege and Russell came to have this enormous influence on 20th century thought, and to say a little about some of the more recent individuals and groups who've come under that influence. But first, a word about the individuals themselves. Frege, a German, was born in 1848 and spent his entire working life in comparative obscurity in the mathematics department of the University of Jena. Not until after his death did his name become known at all widely, even among philosophers. His first major work, published in 1879, was called Begriffschrift. And I'm afraid even the English translation keeps the German title because there's no satisfactory English for it. It means something like the putting of concepts into notation. And we'll begin to see later what that's about. His next major work, published in 1884, is called in English The Foundations of Arithmetic. He went on producing important and original work, most notably in 1893 and 1903, two volumes of the projected larger work called in English The Basic Laws of Arithmetic. But it was all of such depth and difficulty that his work in general remained very largely unknown until Bertrand Russell drew attention to it in 1903. Russell was a totally different sort of person, grandson of a British Prime Minister, from whom he was later, via his elder brother, to inherit an earldom, he was always prominent on the political and social scene as well as in philosophy. In fact, a famous public figure all his life. He did a tremendous amount of popular writing and journalism and broadcasting, which influenced social attitudes among successive generations of British people. I think this has obscured for many the fact that the true foundations of his fame as a philosopher lie in contributions to mathematical logic of a highly professional and technical character. He was born in 1872 and lived till 1970 and was politically active almost to the end, though the great bulk of his philosophical work was done by the 1920s. Here to discuss the work of these two men and some of its influences down to our own day is one of the most famous philosophers of our time, A.J. Eyre, who has written a great deal about Russell, including the best short introductory book on Russell's work. Professor Eyre, let's start with Frege as being mm -hmm. the earlier figure. When he began, what was it he was trying to do? Well, he was trying to um, make up what he thought were the deficiencies in arithmetic. He thought that mathematical statements, as they uh, were ex expressed in his day, were not sufficiently precise and that mathematical proofs were not sufficiently rigorous. And so he began by trying to develop a notation, the Begriffschrift you referred to, in which, it become, would, in which this would be remedied. And the notation was to show exactly what ma ma mathematical statements stated and exactly what their proofs consisted in. It was supposed to make it obvious how one step in a proof succeeded another. And this was, was a deficiency in mathematics at his time, applying even to Euclid, uh, where there were assumptions not made explicit which were required for the proofs to be valid. Wasn't one of the points involved that every argument, including a mathematical proof, has to have premises, and what those premises are often creates problems. And he tried to show that all mathematics was ultimately derived from pure principles of logic. Exactly. Uh, both he and Russell did this, and this involved uh, two enterprises. First of all, defining mathematical concepts in purely logical one, and secondly, showing that mathematics, well, arithmetic anyhow, not all mathematics, but arithmetic was deducible from purely logical uh, premises. And uh, this was achieved, the first part was achieved 
fairly simply, I think a fairly simple illustration will, will, will show how it was done. Uh, if you take, let's say, any couple, let's take um, Tom and Jerry, then you can define them as a couple by saying that they are both members of the set and uh, anything which is a member of the set is, Id is identical with one or other of them. Then you define the number two as a set of, of such sets, as a set of couples. And you do this for all numbers. And there are certain complications about infinity, but in this way, you can define a cardinal number in purely logical terms, is what he did. Mm -hmm. And then also, by <coughs> generalizing logic, which uh, hadn't hitherto been done, Aristotelian logic, which had prevailed oh, from ancient times until the 19th century, was not wholly general. He was able to uh, uh, state uh, premises from which most arithmetic was, was deducible. It was shown later by somebody, uh, by another uh, logician, uh, the Austrian Gödel, that in fact this couldn't be completely done, that, that mm. arithmetic couldn't be completed. But that insofar as it could be completed, Frege showed a method of doing it. Wouldn't it also be true to say that before Frege, uh, the laws of logic had been regarded as laws of thought? That's to say, as something to do with human mental processes. But Frege realized that, that, that this couldn't be so, that the validity of a proof couldn't depend on our psychology. Oh yes, this was very important. This is one of, one of the most Im important things that Frege did. And he began by, uh, one of his early works was an attack on a book of, on arithmetic by a German philosopher called Husserl, in which logic was represented as a theory of judgment. And this was, it was how it was viewed by the German idealists. And uh, Frege insisted it was entirely objective, had nothing to do with, with uh, psychological processes, but that uh, the sets in which he reduced numbers were entirely objective things, and that uh, logic was uh, quite independent of, of, wasn't about psychology at all, that these were <coughs> objective <coughs> truths, mm. which of course uh, the mind was capable of grasping. They didn't depend upon features of thinking. Yeah. So the search then becomes, in a math mathematical proof, for what it is that the proof conveys from step to step That's right. that impersonally validates the conclusion, right. regardless of how we think. And this, in a way, accounts for Frege having a <coughs> philosophical interest beyond his purely mathematical work, because he also developed a theory of, of meaning, a theory of, of, of meaning which would show how mathematics could be objectively valid. And he talked of, of the, uh, he tied up the meaning of uh, mathematical statements, but this could be extended to statements in general, with uh, truth conditions, with, with the features in them that, that made them candidates for truth or falsehood. I suppose the most uh, historically influential distinction that he introduced was the distinction between sense and reference, mm -hmm. uh, which has to do with his theory of meaning, and one still hears people constantly referring to this. Can you explain it? Yes, it's, it's, fairly, it's fairly complicated. The two uh, German expressions are Sinn, which is generally translated sense, and Bedeutung, which is translated, uh, well, it is in fact the German word for meaning, but uh, is by philosophers usually translated as either reference or denotation. And uh, the uh, denotation of a name is the object to which it, uh, which it names. I mean, the denotation of Brown McGee is, is you, <laughs> <laughs> the actual person. Yes. Uh, whereas <coughs> the sense of, of, of the name is the contribution that it makes uh, to the meaning. And say, if, if I uh, just say Tom, you have to say to me, who's Tom? And then I say, well, Tom is so-and-so's brother, and or the person who invented such and such, or, or the first person to climb the mountain. And in this way, I give you a sense, and in this <coughs> way, I enable you to identify him. Mm. Now, this distinction becomes important in certain contexts. Generally, um, what you care about in the case of a name is what the name stands for. And, but there are certain cases where it's important to make a distinction between uh, uh, sense and denotation. And one good example would be statements of identity. The uh, Frege's own uh, favorite example was that of the evening star and the morning star, both of which, as you know, uh, are well, in fact, Venus. The same star. Same yes. star, Venus. Yes. And, uh, but if someone says, um, the evening star is identical with the morning star, 
and one takes the reference of these two expressions to uh, be the denotation, then he's simply saying Venus is Venus, which is a tautology and of no interest, whereas in fact the morning star and the evening star is a mathematical discovery. And therefore, in this usage, what the expressions refer to is not their denotation, not the object, but their senses. So in other words, he, he analyzed meaning into two different components. That's right. Sense and reference. Yes. And a statement may have a sense, but not have a reference. No, well, this happens in two ways. And uh, uh, there could be names or, or nominal expressions, like uh, <coughs> the present King of France, yeah. for example, yeah. which has a sense, but no reference, because yeah. uh, nobody co yeah. uh, corresponds to it. And also, there is the complicated case of expressions which have a function in, the, in, in a sentence as contributing to its uh, making it uh, capable of being true or false, um, but don't denote anything like predicates, mm. uh, is, is, is good, is bad, is so on and so on, which themselves are what he called incomplete expressions, namely don't themselves have a reference, but contribute to giving the sentence a sense and through its sense a reference. And these distinctions that he introduced and his theory of meaning have in fact had a, a very widespread influence in philosophy, haven't they? They've become <coughs> very fashionable in recent mm. years, let's mm. say, and, and there's been a, a, a change in the, anyhow in England, and perhaps, to, oh, well, in England and the United States to some extent, and, uh, a change in sort of main concern of philosophy. For a very, very long time, the theory of knowledge was dominant ever since yeah. Descartes in, in the, uh, and his successors in the 17th century. The main concern has been the theory of knowledge, uh, what, we, what, what we, we can know and how we can know it and how we are justified in holding the beliefs we do. And in recent years, this has given way to what's sometimes called the philosophy of logic, which is mainly concerned with questions about meaning. And here, Frege has come into great prominence. And for instance, my successor as professor of logic at Oxford, Michael Dummett, has devoted nearly, uh, I mean, certainly two large books uh, to Frege's work mm. and is concerned with exploring the implications of Frege's distinctions for a theory of meaning. Well, Michael Dummett, who I suppose is, must be called the leading living commentator on Frege, yes. makes enormously large claims for him, doesn't he? He says that he's introduced a whole new era in philosophy, that he has de-psychologized philosophy, that in the way you just explained, he dethroned the theory of knowledge from the center of philosophy and replaced it with logic. And this has changed 300 years of philosophical development. Well, I think there has been a difference of emphasis, but I think that, that uh, Michael exaggerates in two ways. First of all, philosophers have always been concerned with meaning ever since Socrates, who went about saying uh, what is knowledge, what is, what is goodness, and so on, which is a way of asking what, what, these, what the Greek equivalents of these terms meant. So there's always been an interest in, in meaning in, in, in philosophy. And secondly, I don't think interest in the theory of knowledge has totally disappeared. I think, it, I think that, that there are still people who are uh, connected with, with uh, concerned with this. And insofar as even in Michael Dummett's own work, uh, the theory of meaning is very much uh, bound up with uh, questions about truth and falsehood, this also doesn't entirely take us away from the theory of knowledge, because after all, the theory of knowledge is concerned with what reason we have to suppose that certain statements, propositions, <coughs> are true or false. So I think that, that there has been a shift of emphasis, but not the, the, the great break that Dummett insists on. Before we continue with the more recent applications of, of Frege's work, I want to turn to Russell for a yeah. moment. When I introduced this discussion, I emphasized the fact that Frege worked in isolation throughout almost the whole of his life. And this becomes very important when one starts to consider Russell because poor Russell spent the first several years of his life reinventing work that Frege had already done without realizing that he'd done it, didn't he? Uh, Kat, so that should make it rather easy for you to explain to us something about the importance of Russell's very early work. Well, in, I don't in quite know why you say poor Russell, because it is quite true that Russell did a lot of work uh, that Frege had done before him, but Russell also exposed a fatal deficiency in Frege's uh, system. He showed that Frege's system of logic actually contained a paradox. It's like the famous old contradiction of Epimenides the Cretan who said that all Cretans were liars. It yeah. follows in, it, it 
it, it uh, comes into the category of self-defeating propositions. And and although, although on the surface it seems to be trivial, it's not trivial it's because not it, trivial. it shows that the underlying argumentation has something wrong with it. It does. It shows yeah. that one of, one of uh, Frege's essential assumptions led to contradiction. Yeah. And when and Russell in 19, I think it was in 1903, uh, uh, conveyed this in a letter to Frege, mm. and Frege's first reaction was not, oh, I'm wrong. He was simply arrogant to reply, the whole of mathematics has been shown to be worthless. <laughs> <laughs> then he thought this was going too far. Yeah. And he uh, then um, managed to uh, put together some sort of answer mm. to uh, Russell's objection. But then it was shown only after Frege's death, in fact, by a Polish tradition, that Frege's answer also mm. uh, was untenable, led, led to contradiction. And Frege himself never recovered from this blow. After he received, after the publication of the Regrisschrift, of the Regrisschrift, the, yes, the, uh, no, the, the, the Grundgesetze, mm. um, you yourself said earlier, he never wrote the third volume, and he simply gave up. From yeah. 1903 to 1925, his death, he never did anything, and this was the he, result. He thought his life's work had his been demolished. His life has been demolished, yes. yes. Yeah. So that, in fact, um, it is a very, it's a very sad story. Yes, a tragic and, story. And a tragic story. And Russell then went on to meet this paradox in his own way, some uh, complicated thing called the theory of types. Mm -hmm. It remains true, I don't want to press this point, that, that an enormous amount of the, of the work that Russell had done and spent years over, Frege had already done oh, yes. and Russell didn't know. Yes, that is true. But it's also true that although Frege did it first, and some experts today think that Frege did most of it better, it was through Russell that the ideas actually became famous in philosophy and influential in philosophy. Uh, that is it? true. I don't know why it was that Frege's work was so uh, neglected, mm. uh, partly because, uh, for an absurd reason, that um, interest in the new developments of logic was very much an English thing. So therefore, mm. Frege's work wasn't taken up in Germany, uh, because in Germany the psychological, the mistaken psychological view of logic still prevailed yeah. and wasn't taken up in England simply because of English insularity and, and in, uh, incompetence in foreign languages. Yeah. And it was but, left... But Russell, who had been brought up by German governesses and German nurses, did know German. Did know German. And, but even Russell only got it in directly. What happened was that Russell and his collaborator Whitehead went to a congress in Paris in 1903 and met an Italian logician called Peano. Mm. And it was through Peano, uh, whose work mm. enormously impressed them, mm. and who was working in the same direction, though with a less efficient system than Frege's, that they got to hear of Frege. Yeah. And then Russell read yeah. Frege and at once realized how, how mm. important that it was. And the result of all this was that the science of logic, which had remained virtually static for yes. over 2,000 years since Aristotle, mm. suddenly exploded, exploded into a whole new and enormous Enormously. development. Through Rus mainly through Russell and Whitehead's Principia Mathematica, which it took them together about 10, uh, ooh, 10 years to Well, Russell wrote The Principles of Mathematics in 1903, mm. where he does recognizement to Frege, I think, in the preface and in, and in the appendix. Yes, he does, yes. And then, then he went on with his, uh, with his tutor uh, at, at Trinity Cambridge, Whitehead, to write a, a three volume work called Principia Mathematica, in which he actually tried to do the work of deducing mathematics from logic, and it's full of formulae, and, and uh, it, is a, it is a stupendous work, although, as you rightly said, it doesn't uh, quite achieve the standards of logical rigor that, that Frege had achieved uh, before it. But this was the one that really uh, popularized the subject, and then all sorts of people took it up, and it, and it took, from then on, it has proceeded by leaps and bounds. And it's now, so to speak, a major field of intellectual endeavor throughout the Western yes. world in every university. But it's so interesting, on. I think, also should be mentioned mm. that one of the effects has been not so much to subdue mathematics to logic, which is what Frege and Russell wanted, but to subdue logic to mathematics. Yeah. And that the, the, in recent years, uh, sim, uh, mathematical logic has become more and more mathematical. Yes. And, yeah. less, and has had less and less to do with philosophy in general. And even uh, a disciple of Frege, like uh, Michael Dummett, is more interested in the semantic side of it, the theory of meaning, 
than he has hitherto shown himself to be in the purely mathematical side. Well, unlike Frege, Russell actually made the explicit step after he'd done all this work to general philosophy, yes. didn't he? Not until he was 40 years old, but then he did. And he mm. started producing general works of philosophy. Can you give us some indication of, 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 of what position Well, it's very odd how, how little the two are connected. They, uh, um, the one place where I suppose they are connected is something that Russell called the theory of uh, descriptions. There was a puzzle about the meaning of, of statements like the uh, present king of France, which didn't denote anything. Well, did you say the present king of France is bald? Exactly. There is no king of France. Yeah, and, 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 therefore, therefore, and didn't denote anything, and therefore there was a question how it could be meaningful. And there had been philosophers, a, a notable example is, is a German called Meinong, who then uh, thought that, that uh, these things denoted what he called subsistent entities. And Russell thought this was rubbish. And he, he showed a way of translating out such expressions by showing that they, in fact, contained covered existence uh, uh, claims. Mm. Uh, getting past his, his ball was translated into uh, there is one thing that now rules over France, and whatever it is that rules over France is bald, roughly. Mm. And this uh, got rid of the, of the apparent paradox. And so in that way, his logical work had a philosophical implication. Mm. But in the main, he simply went off on another tack. His first purely philosophical book uh, came out in 1912. It's called The Problems of Philosophy. It's a home university library book. And in my view, still the best introduction to philosophy that there is, because Russell is such a marvelous writer, though it's a little bit old-fashioned. And there, he really takes no account of his logical work at all. He simply continues the British empiricist tradition. This is a book that follows straight on from Berkeley, Locke, Berkeley, and Hume. And it starts off with the theory of, of perception. It's very like Berkeley there. It says that what we perceive are not tables and chairs and things, but what Berkeley, what Locke called simple ideas, what uh, Russell, following his friend Moore, called sense data, and then deals with the old traditional philosophical question, how on the basis of being presented with these sense impressions do we arrive at physical objects? And then he deals with, with a set of traditional philosophical problems in, in that sort of way. Mm -hmm. And uh, he more or less gave up logic after uh, Principia Mathematica. He himself said that um, this wore him out. Um, he collaborated in the book, on the book with Whitehead, but Whitehead was teaching mathematics at uh, Cambridge and mainly mm -hmm. occupied with that. Mm -hmm. Russell at that time was living uh, independently. Well, he had a lectureship at Cambridge from 1910 to 1915, but in the first decade of the century, he was living on his independent income. And so he had that, the actual work of writing out all these proofs. Mm -hmm. And he said that this really um, incapacitated him from ever doing any detailed work in future. And this is to some extent true. All his later work is full of brilliant ideas he never, he never fully works out. At a certain point, he gets bored. He says, oh, yes, it goes on like this. He doesn't bother to, to yeah. dot the I's and, and cross the T's. And this is true of all his later work. I think that I see one very important continuing concern in the later work. I'd be interested to know if you agree with this or not. You've just said, I'm sure rightly, that, that Russell was a, a radical empiricist in oh, the yes. direct tradition of Locke and Hume. Certainly. Uh, it seems to me that Russell was always concerned to validate the natural sciences in terms of sense data, that he always wanted to show that the whole corpus of our scientific knowledge could be derived from and was derived from nothing but observations and our reflections on our observations. Well, not always. Uh, I think you make one very important point here, and one, in fact, that I overlooked when I was uh, uh, talking a few moments ago, and that is that from the very beginning, Russell's approach to philosophy was an interest in justification. There's, there's quite an amusing story that uh, when he was about 12, his elder brother, who was sent to school, Russell was taught at home, the elder brother, Frank, was, was sent to school, taught Russell geometry, and uh, Russell refused to accept the axioms. He wanted to have them proved, and his brother said that um, they couldn't get on unless they, he, Russell accepted the axioms, so he agreed to provisionally. But he always wanted just, um, to have everything justified. And this was common both in his approach to logic and mathematics and in his approach to other branches of knowledge, and as you say, also in his approach to science. He wanted to have a basis for our belief in science. And, but here 
his views varied. In the um, book I uh, mentioned, uh, Problems of Philosophy, it's quite true that he wanted to start with sense data, but he didn't think that all scientific or even all common sense statements, statements like that of the table, can be, could be reduced to sensory statements. He, he adopted a causal theory uh, that you could um, assume the existence of the physical world as the best explanation for our sensory experiences. Then he changed his view, and in the next important book that he published on the theory of, uh, of knowledge, which was uh, our knowledge of the external world, which came out in 1914, he did take the view you, just, you uh, just referred to, namely he thought you could actually reduce uh, every, not only every common sense statement, but every scientific statement to statements about our actual and, and possible hypothetical uh, sense experiences. And this, uh, this, mm. this view, which is technically known as phenomenalism, was the view of, of uh, Berkeley, if you rob Berkeley of God, and <laughs> also the view of John Stuart Mill, who was in, incidentally Russell's godfather, yeah. uh, lay godfather, because, they hadn't, because didn't Russell's believe parents in God. And, yeah. and, and, and John Stuart Mill didn't believe in God, but he's yeah. lay godfather. Um, this phenomenalistic view uh, was developed in Arnold's uh, The External World and also in some important essays that Russell wrote mm. in uh, a book called Mysticism and Logic, which he produced during the First World War, mm. an essay called uh, uh, something like sense data and physics is, is the most important one there. And he continued this um, in another important book called The Analysis of Mind, which came out, I think, in 1921. And he adopted a theory which had been advanced before him by the pragmatist William James, Henry James's um, elder brother, in which both mind and matter were composed of what James called neutral stuff and which were, were in fact uh, sense data and images and, and they differed only in being different arrangements of this fundamental data. But then Russell gave this up and in 1925, well 1925 is a curious book, Analysis of Matter, uh, where, he, where the, the traces of this view still remaining, but he mainly went back to the causal theory that, that he'd uh, held in 1912 and when he revived his interest in philosophy in the uh, 1940s, and, and in his final, or his next to last, philosophical book, uh, Human Knowledge, Its Scope and Limits, he goes back to a causal theory. Mm -hmm. he, always, he always thought that the basis of our knowledge uh, was um, <laughs> lay in, 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 in sense experience, but he varied uh, in, uh, in the next step. I mean, he, uh, it was only during one period of his work that he thought that the whole thing could be uh, reduced to sensory terms, mm. uh, more often, and certainly in the la at the end of his life very vehemently, he, he adhered to the causal theory, which put the physical world beyond the veil of observation. One thing that is constant with Russell um, is the attempt to bring a wholly new rigour to bear in yes. philosophy, not only of a logical kind, but one's tempted to say of a scientific kind. He was always very concerned, for example, that our beliefs should relate to the evidence for them. This is something he reiterated over and over again, isn't it? And it's something which, if taken seriously, sweeps aside a great deal of traditional philosophizing and traditional thinking. Oh yes, that, that I think is true. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that this, you already mentioned that uh, uh, R Russell had an on Wittgenstein, and indeed Wittgenstein was Russell's uh, pupil, pupil. Mm. and uh, uh, as uh, you know, Wittgenstein and also that group of philosophers in Vienna called the Vienna Circle condemned what they call metaphysics, mm. and metaphysics in their view was uh, consisted at least partly in any attempt to uh, describe an, uh, the world in non-scientific terms. Mm. They thought that this was the only world there is and that uh, science uh, was a matter of forming theories about it, which yeah. were verified by observation, and any assumption that there was a superior world, a world of, uh, inhabited by gods or anything of that sort, was nonsensical. And Russell mm -hmm. certainly all the time held this, yeah. and was always concerned to justify it, uh, science, and was always worried by the fact he thought the justification for science was extremely problematic. Yes. I mean, and it remained problematic to the end. To the end, I mean, yes. and in, it's very interesting, in, in the last book that he wrote, Human Knowledge, the one I referred to, he then sets out what he thinks 
are the set of assumptions that require to be made if belief in scientific theories is to be justified, and makes it quite clear do you think these, these assumptions uh, mm. must, as it were, be taken on faith. Yes. And yes. Uh, he tried to work out uh, what we call a theory of induction, but was never entirely satisfied with it, and, and more or less mm. said, well, I, I remember what he said. He said that um, we really can't be sure that science is true, but it has a greater chance of being true than anything else <laughs> that, that, that can be set up as its rival. Yes. Though he still couldn't validate it in the way he, he would He couldn't wish. validate it in the way he would like to, no, uh, like no. to have done. Let's just talk now in an orderly way about the influence of Russell, because he and Wittgenstein, I suppose, must be the two most influential philosophers yes. in the 20th century, at least in the English-speaking world. Now, I suppose Russell's first great influence was on his immediate contemporaries, and indeed older uh, contemporaries like Whitehead and Moore in the, in the Cambridge of his young day. Um, let us put it this way. Uh, in in the, the purely uh, logical work, in which Russell and Whitehead collaborated, it was, I think, Russell who had the more, more interesting ideas. I mean, I think the yeah. theory of types, the theory of descriptions, uh, came from Russell. Mm. But when it came to uh, trying to apply that sort of technique to philosophy, which to a certain extent Russell did uh, in our knowledge of the external world, for example, in trying to reduce abstract uh, concepts, like concepts of points and instants, uh, to observational terms, then it was Whitehead who took the lead, and Russell got his ideas from Whitehead. And indeed, they quarrelled over this because uh, Russell didn't pay Whitehead sufficient acknowledgement. You'll find that they developed in two books of Whitehead that came out after the war: the principles of natural knowledge and the concept of nature. Mm. And Russell, at one time, um, was influenced by MacTaggart, who was a disciple of Hegel, and got Russell to be both Russell and Moore to be in, to be idealists. And Moore, first of all, rebelled against this in the interest of common sense. Moore was a great defender of common sense and influenced Russell to the extent that he, that he uh, cured Russell of any belief in idealism. So the, the, the influence, their influence went that way. Mm -hmm. Also, with respect to ethics, which Russell was never greatly interested, he accepted, like all Bloomsbury, he accepted Moore's Principia Ethica. He believed that good was a non-natural, indefinable um, uh, concept and so on. Yeah. Uh, but then, Russell had a very big influence on the later, or my generation of, of, of philosophers, in as much as he convinced us that um, since science was sovereign in the description of the world, all that philosophy could do was uh, elucidate and analyze. And so Russell can be regarded, I think, as the father of analysis. Mm. But here he differs profoundly from Wittgenstein. Uh, I don't want to go too, too deeply into Wittgenstein, but... Well, but I, I'd rather you didn't, because we're going to devote the whole of the next programme to Wittgenstein. But one thing that will come out yes. in our next programme yes. is that Wittgenstein thought that philosophy was largely a matter of people be getting into a muddle, and yes. that the business of people like Wittgenstein was to, uh, as in his own famous phrase, show the fly the way out of the fly bottle, to cure yes. people of these muddles. Yes. Yes. Whereas Russell always thought that philosophical problems had a solution. And that was why he was so yeah. very hostile to the purely linguistic philosophy that developed, for example, at Oxford after the war under the leadership of, of, of Austin, because he thought this was the, the, the mere exploration of language for its own sake, the, the, the exploration of the implications of English usage, was trivial. Mm. And Russell really thought that there were questions about justification of our beliefs that um, it was the business of philosophy to answer, and that these questions were answerable. He thought that the answers could be discovered if you worked at it hard enough, otherwise he didn't think philosophy was worth doing. I'd like and here I agree with it. Yes, I was going to say, I want to put a personal question to you, because you, all your life you have acknowledged that you yourself have been enormously influenced oh, by yes. Russell, and, and you make that very clear, and always have. So you, you can tell us what it's like from the inside, as it were, to have been influenced by Russell. What has its influence been on you? On me, uh, it's been, first of all, that unlike most of my contemporaries, I still think one should start with what Russell called sense data, what I now prefer to call sense qualia, that is a, a technical difference, whether you begin with particulars or, 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 more, or something more general. Um, but for our present purposes, it comes to the same thing. So that on the whole, I, I, sh I share his... Um, uh, certainly the starting point of his views on perception. 
I share the, I also agree with the importance, the primacy he attaches to the theory of knowledge. I uh, am, and I've always been, a thoroughgoing empiricist. I agree with the view that Russell derived from Hume that there's no necessity other than logical necessity, uh, so that there's no such thing as causal necessity. Causal is just the matter uh, uh, what Hume originally s uh, said it was, namely constant conjunction and something purely uh, contingent. I agree with Russell in rejecting any form of theology, or anyhow transcendent theology, and in rejecting metaphysics. And I also, and most importantly, agree with Russell, that philosophy wouldn't be worth doing unless it posed questions to which we could find the answers. Perhaps not he, perhaps not I, but cleverer persons than I will eventually find the answers. And all these are examples not just of your agreeing with him, but of him having influence. Oh, yes. Are they? All of them, quite yes. directly. Yes, quite yeah. directly, quite directly. And I think you've even been influenced by him in the way you write, haven't you? That appears well, to I me Well, I do to be regard him as a master of English prose, yeah. and mm. well, well, I think I'm not in the same class as Russell as a philosopher, but I do think that I do write. Write uh, English reasonably well, and I do think. And again, well, partly uh, under his influence. And again, partly under his influence. Yes, yes. I think yes. there is affiliation yes. there, both of ideas and of style, uh, from Hume through Mill uh, 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 to Russell, and coming down a stage to me. Yeah. Now the. The philosophers that we're discussing here, Frege and Russell, have enormous effect on the living, yourself included. And I now want to talk about the revival of interest in Frege after the Second World War, so that the interest in Frege and the interest in Russell, for the first time, proceed side by side into the age that, yes. we, that, that we now live in. It's very difficult to account for historical events, particularly in such short a perspective, yeah. and the, I think the, in, the, there was certainly was, in, immediately after the war, a decline in Russell's influence, anyhow, in England. <coughs> and this was, I think, not due to uh, a revival of interest in Frege, but to uh, uh, an increased importance attached to the work of Wittgenstein and Moore. In Moore's case, though I enormously liked and respected him as a man, I think philosophically it was excessive. And uh, I think this was... Uh, Two people responsible for this were partly, not so much Ryle, who respected Russell, but mainly Austin, who uh, was the linguistic philosopher in the narrowest possible sense, and had a great respect for Moore <laughs> as, as uh, uh, someone who attached great importance to ordering his usage into common sense and so on. Common sense was said by Russell, incidentally, to be the metaphysics of savages. Yes, and yes. I think it was the upgrading of Moore. Mm. Uh, that was responsible for at that time for the downgrading of Russell. I, and this is a trend that's now been reversed, I'm yes. glad to I, say. I, I think you go a bit too far in saying Russell was downgraded, because if one thinks back to those post-war years and thinks now who were the major yeah. philosophers in the English-speaking world, the shortest of short lists would have to include, apart from Russell himself, Wittgenstein, Karl Popper, Quine, Gilbert Ryle, yourself, and all of you were massively influenced by Russell. Yes. Uh, perhaps, perhaps I'm, I, uh, uh, I mean, yes, so you would know better than I, because you, after all, were up at Oxford at, in, 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 in the 50s when, when I had already departed um, uh, for, for, for London. But I mean, my, certainly the impression reaching us in London <laughs> was that Russell was being unbearable. That means you're were, taking an Oxford-based view, and I think that's <laughs> what's mistaken about the view. Right? That's possibly true, I think true, there yes. were other people around then who yes. disparaged Russell. It's yes. perfectly true. Yes. But their work and their influence well, has not lasted. I'm very glad to hear, to yeah. hear this. Yeah. And I certainly, Russell has, has, has uh, recovered. Yes. He himself, yes. though, perhaps I'm influenced by the fact that he himself thought this. Because yes. I was seeing a great deal of, deal of him at the time. I, I organized a little group in, in, in London that he mm. attended, and he was certainly uh, miffed, is perhaps too mild a word, mm. um, but he thought that, 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 he, that he wasn't getting his due. Mm. Uh, and all philosophers are slightly vain, and, and he, this certainly caused him yeah. pain. But we agree, in any case, that, that he's come back. He's come and, back, certainly. And, yes. Now, um, the revival of Frege is something that, that I really, I think I'm can't explain. Uh, I don't even know exactly how it happened. Probably uh, um, it started in America uh, with the development of, of a school of logicians led by a man called Alonzo Church, who insisted on very great rigor in logic and mathematics and found it in Frege and didn't find it in, in Russell and Whitehead. Though, of course, they did find it elsewhere. They found it, for example, in Hilbert, though they disagreed with Hilbert for other reasons. And in England, it seems to have been 
the first evidence I can find of it is in a book published oh, fairly late, about 1960, I think, by uh, William and Martha Neal, which is a very uh, impressive history of logic, mm -hmm. in, which, in which very great importance is given to Frege. He's put on a level with Aristotle. These are the two great names. And the, You've and jumped over minute, one I've thing. I've jumped over one thing. Yes. You suddenly yes. remind me there yeah. was a translation in the early 50s. 1950 in, itself. 1950 itself, was yeah. it? Yeah. Made by Austin yes. of uh, Frege's Grundlagen, or yes. it? Yes. and then there was also a translation made uh, two or three years later by uh, Max Black, an Englishman living, uh, working in America, and by Peter Geech, mm. uh, of two of Frege's very obscure but important semantic essays, one of them called Sense and Reference, and the other called mm. Function and Concept. Mm. And so there was in the early 50s this sudden interest in Frege, but I'm not quite certain what led to it, or indeed what consequences it had. Well, a lot of very bright, younger people took it up, didn't they, and yeah. were influenced by it. Whether that'll last or yes. not, I don't know, but it certainly seems to me to have been going on recently. I find very little influence of Frege in current philosophical work, apart from the work of Dummett. If you, if you look at the example, I think now perhaps uh, some of the most interesting work being done is being done in America, and if you look at the work of people like Quine and, and Putnam and, and Thomas Nagel and, uh, and, and Donald Davidson in particular, you don't find so strong an influence of Frege, except perhaps in Davidson's case, indirectly through the work of um, the Polish tradition, Tarski on truth, which yeah. in a sense links up yes. with Frege, as much yes. as Frege linked himself linked meaning and mm. truth. Mm. Are you confident that the influence of Russell will last? Uh, yes. You are. Why? Why so? Because I think, because that, uh, because that is the view I take of philosophy. I think mm. that, that the questions he asked are the important philosophical questions, and I think that he, his answers to them, whether uh, right or wrong, will always need to be taken into consideration. And if I'm right about you, too, you also think that his approach, to, his conception of what philosophy is, is the right conception. Yes. That it consists of clarification, therefore analysis, yeah. and justification, therefore argument, of our important beliefs. Written in straightforward English prose. Oh, well, not necessarily English, but written in... <laughs> in straightforward prose. In straightforward prose, yes. Thank you very much, Professor Eyre.